And so on tonight, we, on last week, we looked at part th chapter three of part four of our study guide, and we specifically focused on Genesis 12, uh, verses one through seven, which was when Abraham was called to come out of earth so that God could create a people for himself, beginning with, with a man called Abram, who would later be called Abraham. You know, the Bible says that Abraham is the father of the faith. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then you are also a seed of Abraham. And so, hey, God's church is not just comprised of those uh, who started out in, during the day of Jesus Christ, but those who are also came up with Abraham because the Bible says that God, Abraham believed God. And God counted it unto him as righteousness. And it's no different for us in today's time. What is counted to you as righteousness is your belief in God. You can know the Bible from Genesis chapter 1 to the end of the book of Revelation. But if you don't believe what you've read, then it is not counted unto you as righteousness. And so when we talked, the three points that we pressed on, la on the time, last time we were together was Abram's covenantal future, Abram's covenantal failure, and Abram's covenantal fulfillment. And on your handout, I highlighted covenant, covenantal because it behooves us to understand what a covenant refers to. And a covenant, especially with God, refers to be in a personal relationship with God. A personal relationship with God that is also a prosperous relationship, but it's also a permanent relationship. The Bible says that once you accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you are in his all-powerful hand. And no man can pluck you out. And so once you sincerely give your life to Jesus Christ, then your relationship with him is permanent. And it's also a guaranteed relationship. But when we talked about Abram's covenantal future, we were talking about how, uh, how the, not only was Abram's uh, uh, relationship with God a guaranteed relationship, but that for it to remain guaranteed, his life had to line up with what God's plan was for him. And so if we want to be have that guaranteed, personal, prosperous, and permanent relationship with God, then you have to make sure that your life lines up with the plan that God has for you. Y'all know how we used to say that man makes plans, but God laughs at your plans. Because our plans aren't worth a hill of beans. But if you want the blessings that you can receive from God, then you have to be following the plan that God has for your life. And the second thing we talked about was Abram's covenantal failure. Because you do remember when God called Abram to come out of earth, he not just told him to come out of earth, but he told him to separate yourself from all other family relationships. And what did Abram do? Bible said that Abram took Lot with him. And because he uh, took Lot with him, then what did he do? He failed what God had told him to do. Or he, or he will say he, he did not completely satisfy what God had commanded him to do. And so when God went to show him the blessings that he had for him, the blessings no longer included Abraham himself but they only included Abraham's descendants because when God tells us to do something, we need to do it exactly as he has commanded it to do. So I don't know about y'all, but I'd rather receive all of the blessings of God rather than just receive half of what God has just chosen to bless me with. And so lastly, we talked about Abram's covenantal fulfillment. And that covenantal in film fulfillment included the fact that Abram was going to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. We are blessed today because God made a promise to Abram that he would use his life to do what? To bless all 
the families of the earth. And so that's one of the jobs that God has given us. God has given us the job of being a blessing to all the families of the earth, especially those who are not believers in Jesus Christ. And that's really the main focus of our study during this, during this uh, season is because the Bible tells us to go ye unto all nations, teaching them to observe all that God has commanded. And when we fulfill that commandment, guess what we're doing? We are, we are being a blessing to all the families of the earth. What we should not allow the devil to do is to shut us down when we have an opportunity to share the things with somebody else, what God has taught us. And so that was uh, the lesson that we had previously. And so on tonight, we're still in part four of understanding the Old Testament. And chapter four of our study guide talks about the exodus and redemption. Exodus and redemption. And so the three things you see that we're going to talk about in our handout is a two-sided handout. We're going to talk about the captivity of God's people. We're going to talk about the deliverance of God's people. But we're also going to talk about the forgetfulness of God's people. These are the three main points that are made uh, in, part four, in part four in chapter four. And so the commentary that's provided, which and you can read along with me. It says that the final chapters of the book of Genesis describe a period when a great famine had covered the land. There was a massive food shortage. And that next sentence says, but God. Two greatest words in the Bible. Oh, but God. But God had already established a plan to protect and nourish his people by sending them into Egypt where he had already put one of his people in charge. Y'all remember the story when God sent Joseph into Egypt ahead of the rest of the family. And, and, when, he, and when he sent him to Egypt, he actually put him in charge. And that's one of the, uh, I'll say one of the blessings and one of the confidences that we can have in God as it actually relates even to our own political system. Because I believe that if God put one of his people in charge in the Egyptian political system, then you can be doggone sure that God is putting some of his people in charge in the political system that we have in this country. It may look raggedy sometimes. Yeah, but believe you me, God has some of his people working in the background. And so the rest of that sentence says that uh, God had already put one of his own people in charge, who was Joseph, to whom he had given the plan to bless his people even during this time of famine. God being God would also be a blessing to those who were not yet his people and allow all of Egypt to benefit from the plan that he had. God cannot help himself. He wants all people to benefit from the plan that he has. And so that's why I gave you Matthew 5 and 45, which says when you look it up for yourself, that God reigns on the just and the unjust. And I don't know about y'all, but there was a time when I wasn't one of the just. I was one of the unjust. Yeah, but I learned that I had a reason to be grateful because God reigns on the just and the unjust. Yeah, but I gave you John 6 and 44, and I'm going to leave that one up to you. Look it up for yourself because y'all starting to get too handicapped on me. Think I'm going to tell you everything. Well, I'm going to leave you here with a homework assignment. Look at John 6 and 44. And so the rest of the commentary says, during this time, the Egyptians became fearful of God's people because God's people began to multiply and fill the land to try and stunt the growth of God's people. Y'all do, that's what the devil does. The devil tries to stunt the growth of God's people. That's why he puts distractions in our lives to keep us from the word of God, to cause us to deprioritize the word of God in our life because he wants to stunt our growth. God has told us that we're supposed to go on 
to maturity. There's not supposed to be somebody who has claimed to walk with God for 10, 20 years and still be immature. But they are still immature because they fall into the gang move of the devil. And that is to stunt their growth. And so it happened with the same in the, uh, in the day of the, when the people of Israel were in Egyptian captivity. It says to try and stunt the growth of God's people, the Egyptians placed heavy burdens on them in an attempt to oppress them. And that reference is in Exodus chapter 1, so you can read it for yourself. But it says, but no matter how much the Egyptians continued to oppress God's people, they still still continue to multiply because this is what God had planned. And so I gave you Genesis 22 and 17 so you can see what God actually promised Abraham. He told, who was Abram at this time, he told him, he said that I'm going to multiply your people to where they'll be like the stars in the heavens and the sand on the seashore. God had made Abraham that promise. And then the other two scriptures show how God followed up on that promise. Because Exodus 1 and 5 says that there were only about 70 people who went into Egypt. But when they were redeemed from Egypt, there was over 600,000 men, not counting the women and the children. So no matter how hard they tried to stunt their growth, God had promised it. And they couldn't stop it from happening. The scripture of commentary goes on to say that it does not matter what man tries to do to oppress God's people because whatever God has planned, guess what? That will be done. So don't stress yourself about oppressors who show up in your life. If God has promised it, then they can't do nothing to stop it. And so look at Proverbs 19 and 21 with me. It says, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. And that bonus scripture that I gave you, Job 42 and 2, Job said that he said that whenever God has a plan, there's nothing that can thwart it. Yeah. Because our God has all power in his hand. And if he made a promise and a plan, he will hold to it. The Bible says that the promises of God are yes, and they'll make you say amen. Yeah, because nothing can stop any plan that God has for his people. Look at Isaiah 55 and 11. It says, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing." for which I sent it. Boy, if you want to be a part of a successful plan, then you need to get on board with God's plan. And that bonus scripture I gave you, Matthew 4 and 4, says that man shall not live by bread alone, but we live by every word that has proceeded out of the mouth of God. Our lives should be lived to give God the glory. And the way that we live life to give God the glory is by living life according to every word that has come out of his mouth. There should be nothing in God's word that you have a problem with. Because you know that every word in God's word is the right word. And it's the right word that should be done. And it is a part of the plan that God has for us that will always succeed. And so look at the takeaway. It said that if we want to associate ourselves with a plan that will always succeed, then we better associate our plans with the plans that have come out of the mouth of God. And so flip your paper over and let's look at the deliverance of God's people. And as you can tell, we're not going to be long tonight. And so the commentary says, Chan, who is the author of our uh, study guide, emphasizes that the deliverance of God's people from captivity was because of the encounter that they had with God. 
this encounter began with Moses, the leader that God raised up from the time of his birth. Boy, that's worth holding on to. And I'm going to say that again. This encounter began with Moses, the leader that God raised up from the time of his birth. And I gave a little personal note, which is why I have a problem with abortion. And it says that this is what makes abortion counterproductive to the plan of God because some of the things that God wants to deliver us from may come through those whom he raises up from the time of their birth. And you see, I put in parentheses the example of cancer. How do we not know that God is ready to give somebody the cure for cancer? But some mother or some father decided to abort that child. And when a child is aborted, we never know what plan God had for them, which would have been a plan to save us or to rescue us from some, uh, some of these serious things that we deal with in this world. And so the commentary goes on to say, the people's encounter with God continued through the miracles that he performed so that they might experience and come to know his awesome power which ultimately included the parting of the Red Sea. But Exodus 3 and 7 emphasizes that if God's people had never cried out to him, they would have never had this encounter if they had not called upon God then they would have never experienced the awesome power of God to deliver them. One of the reasons why we miss out on the awesome power of, God, of our God to deliver us is because we do not cry out for, to him. That's why the Bible tells us to trust in the Lord and lean not to your own understanding because it's our own understanding that gets us in trouble. But rather than doing what you think is the right thing to do, you ought to always look to God and ask God to reveal to you what is the right thing to do. Sometimes we get too smart for ourselves. And so look at Psalm 18, 2 through 3. It says that the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge and a place of refuge is a place that you run to for safety. Yeah, and when we need a deliverer, we ought to be doing what? Running to God for safety. David says that he's my shield and the horn of my salvation. And whenever you see a reference to, to the horn uh, in Scripture, especially in the context of deliverance, it refers to the power of God. The only reason why God is able to save and deliver us from some of the things that we go through is because he has all power. It says that he's not only the horn of my salvation, but he's my stronghold. So when I run to him, he has the strength to hold on to me. Verse 3 says, I call to the Lord who is worthy of praise. And I highlighted those because it emphasizes the fact that when you call upon the Lord for deliverance, you know what you're also doing? You're also praising God. Yeah, because you are saying that he is able to deliver me from whatever I'm going through. But I also like that phrase that says, who is worthy of praise? Because in the original Hebrew language, that actually is one word. And that one word is shine. And so when we call upon the Lord because we know that he's worthy of the praise, then what I'm also doing is I'm shining a light on our God. Because that word called in the original Hebrew language refers to calling on God out loud, being unashamed and unafraid to let anybody around you understand that I'm going to call on my God. There's nothing that's going to stop me from calling on my God, no matter where I am when I need him. Yeah. When uh, Peter started walking on the water, but put his eyes in the wrong place and began to sink, guess what he was? He was unafraid to call upon his God. And so when we fall into situations where we feel like we are sinking, that's one of the first things you ought to do is call upon your God. 
because he has all power and can deliver us from anything that we're dealing with or going through. But the good thing about calling on him out loud is because you are shining a light on him. And so guess what God nine times out of ten will do? He will surround you with people who do not believe in God like you believe in God. And because you've shined a light on God, guess what you've taught them to do? That they need to call on him too. And so that's why early I told y'all that I thank God for the people who he placed in my life who were mature believers who could guide me and establish the same faith that they had that it would be established in me. Y'all do remember what the apostle Paul told Timothy. He said, boy, one of the things I praise God for is for your mother and your grandmother. Because that same faith that's in you was in them first. And one of the things that we ought to do is allow God to use us to help others establish the same type of faith that we have in ourselves. Many of y'all have probably heard me tell this story before. But when I first got saved, boy, I was on fire for the Lord. And every time I used to go by my mama's house, my mama used to ask me the question, do we have to talk about God every time you come over here? And I told my mama, you know what, mama, I guess we can't talk because I'm going to talk about God. And can I tell y'all what happens now when I go to my mama's house? Every time I go to her house, we got to talk about God. And so that same faith that I was willing to demonstrate in her presence is the same faith that she caught. And now she's on fire for the Lord. But that's the same thing that God wants to do with all of us. Somebody ought to be able to say that the faith that they have now is because they saw that same faith in you. And so that's what we want to do. We want to shine a light upon God when we go through the things that we go through. And so look at the takeaway. The takeaway says, one of the reasons that we should cry out loud to God for deliverance is because it shines a light that points to him as a delivering God for those who do not know him. All right, and so our last point is the forgetfulness of God's people. And so the commentary says that Clench Chan closes chapter 4 by providing us with one of the saddest connotations associated with God's people, which is that they are a forgetful people. After God delivered his people, they became a grumbling and a complaining people. Grumbling and complaining is an outward demonstration of a mistrust in God. And one of the things that God's people should not do is outwardly demonstrate that they do not trust God. And so turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 17. Jeremiah chapter 17. Oh, good stuff in, Jer in the book of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 29 and 11. So Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 5 through 8. Is everybody there who wants to be there? If you're not, say, wait on me. Uh, amen. Jeremiah chapter 17, begin at verse 5. Amen? Amen. And so begin at verse 5, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, thus says the Lord. They might as well have written that in red. Thus says the Lord. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord and so when a man trusts in man which that really is a reference to man trusting in himself that means that this is the type of person whose heart has departed from the Lord verse 6 says for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes boy you that's why we was taught to watch words closely because it doesn't say that good wasn't coming 
it says that he wouldn't see it. And how many times have we overlooked the good that had come our way? Because we was too busy trusting in ourselves. Boy, right there, you ought to say, help me, Holy Spirit. Yeah. It goes on to say, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness and in a salt land which is not inhabited. That means it would not receive the nourishment, even though nourishment had clearly showed up. Verse 7 says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. And remember last time I gave y'all the definition of biblical hope, which means the desire to experience the promises of God, but have the patience to wait for it. And so the blessed man is the one who desires to experience the promises of God. And so verse 8 says, for he shall be like a tree planted. By the rivers of water, which spreads out its roots by the river. And so what does God do with this tree that he plants by the rivers of water? He's planting them in the place where that they can be blessed and receive nourishment. And so when we placed our trust in God, guess what God will do for you? He will plant you in the place where you can be blessed. Maybe sometimes some of us feel like that we're in a place where we're not being blessed. Well, maybe that's a place where you put yourself and God did not put you. But when you place your full trust in God, God will put you in the place where you can be blessed. And I love the way it talks about which spreads its roots by the river because it means that this tree, all he had to do if it wanted to be blessed was just reach out for the blessing. Yeah. And I thank God for planting me where he planted me. Because in the places where he's planted me, I can just reach out for the blessings. And it says, and will not fear when he comes. But his leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought. And we know that anxiety is just another form of fear. Anxiety is fear of the future. And so when we have a what? Covenantal relationship with God like we talked about last time, then guess what? We have no fear of, of the future because we serve the God who guarantees us a blessed future, especially when we do what? When we trust in him. And so it says, nor will cease from yielding fruit. And the thing we have to clearly understand is that when a tree that is planted by the rivers of the water, they can re just reach out for it. When it yields its fruit, that fruit is not for you. How many times have you seen a tree eating its own fruit? The yielding of the fruit means that not only will God bless you, but he will bless you to the extent where you can be a blessing to somebody else. And remember, that's what God called us to do. He called us to what? To be a blessing to others. Many of y'all may remember that lesson that Pastor Abraham talked about uh, years ago. Talked about living in the salsa. And remember he taught in that lesson, he talked about how what was in the cup belongs to us. But what flows over into the salsa belongs to somebody else. And so when you receive an overflow of blessing, you need to remind yourself, this ain't for me. God gave this to me so that I can be a blessing to somebody else. Boy, I was looking in my closet the other day, and I was looking at all these clothes I don't wear. And I was like, good God Almighty, let me get a trash bag, put these clothes in this trash bag so I can do what? Be a blessing to somebody else. How many of us have so much food that you end up throwing away food? I think all of us ought to be in the catering business. We ought to have some of them to go th things in our cabinet so that food that we was going to throw away, we can put it in the to-go basket and take it to somebody who's not blessed in the way that we are. And then when you do it, guess what you ought to do? Shine a light on God so that they'll understand where true blessings come from. And so let's go to the takeaway. The takeaway says, those who trust in God will be blessed. 
because God himself will plant them where they can be blessed. Amen? All right. Y'all get glory to hand clap for his awesome word. Yeah. Our Father and our God, oh, how we thank you for this night. We thank you, dear Father God, for revealing to us once again the type of God that you are. Thank you for reminding us, dear Father God, that you are the God who will deliver us if we would just call upon your name. Thank you for reminding us, dear Father God, that one of the things that we want to do, dear Father, is not be a forgetful people and always to remember all the ways that you have blessed us, dear Father God, so that it will prevent us from grumbling or complaining. Thank you, dear Father God, for reminding us that when we lift up prayers and supplications unto you, we are supposed to do it with thanksgiving, dear Father God. And the more that we remind ourselves of the things that we have to be thankful for, then it will cause us to forget the things that we wanted to complain about in the first place. And so we just thank you for all the things that you're doing in our lives. Thank you for the changes that you are making in our lives. Thank you, dear Father God, for working on the half-hood side of me so that I can be more of what you would have me to become. We thank you and we love you for all that you do and have done. You're an awesomely wonderful God. This prayer we pray in Jesus Christ's name and all of God's people said, amen, amen.